and I, we, have been given a, what I would call a dawning task, very challenging as a church, and we mention it quite often, even in the sermonette. We've been given the commission of preaching the gospel to the world, and also uh, share part of that, a very serious warning to modern-day Israel of the coming tribulation and the, the day of the Lord. And that's a very important job if we've been given. And really the same was given, same, same is true for what was given to the 12 apostles to go out and preach the gospel to the world. And that, but they, they had to do it on foot or uh, uh, perhaps on donkeys or horses perhaps, but uh, primarily on foot walking around and uh, let's see, we're in the, ocean, the sea or whatever, they would take ships, but uh, very challenging to go out to the world at that time for them to do that. And we might wonder, we, don't, I know we, we talk about it, but that uh, how would such a small group of people, and there are 10, 11, 12,000 that are part of the living church of God, literally, and so it's such a small group with so little resource and resources, and you might translate that as particularly as money, with a, a very limited amount of money by comparison to the world, how are we to accomplish such a huge and formidable task we've been given? That, you know, in the eyes of the world, or if you were to talk to someone about what we do or what, what we uh, hope to do, and we then could itemize the resources and our size that some might think we're sort of fantasizing <laughs> that we could do what God has challenged us to do. It is a very daunting task. And humanly, it is not only formidable, but in reality, humanly, it would be impossible to accomplish that. So this afternoon, I'd like to review the scriptures that show us that God and Christ will guide and complete the work he has given us to do and certainly be a part of that. But very likely in doing so, it'll be in a fashion that we can either see or anticipate. And we'll look at some things in the Bible that show what has transpired in the past, but nonetheless review what shows the Bible shows that he will complete the work and use human beings to do it. So to begin, let's uh, look at a couple of scriptures which record the fundamental claim that God makes regarding his will and his plan. Let's turn back to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. And we'll read verses 9 through 11. To remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I, I will, what I want to do, what I plan to do, it'll get done. In verse 11, calling a bird of prey from the east. The man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Now I think most of us know that this is a reference back to the initial part of the prophecy that's given here in Isaiah 45 and 46. It's a very specific and prophetic statement he makes, identifying a man named Cyrus as the one who would conquer Babylon. Let's turn back just the previous chapter in chapter 45. We'll read verses 1 through 6. It says, Thus says the Eternal to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. 
I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Eternal, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have made named you, though you have not known me. I am the Eternal, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Eternal, and there is no other. So again, God makes this claim that he is in absolute and total control of everything that transpires on this earth and, and for the whole universe. That he does these things, he forecasts these things, foretells them, so that we can know that he is God. When he names the Cyrus way in advance, and then he was born, and he did exactly what is prophesied here in going into Babylon the way it was is stated, that it does convince us, it's meant to convince us that God is in charge and able to do whatever he plans and proclaims to do. So that's just his, his statement. So I'd like to review in that context two accounts that show out, that show he will carry out his plan, but in ways that man would not have fathomed, and certainly we would not have, ways that he can manage and perform. Let's turn back to Judges chapter 7. And the two accounts are well known to us, but I think they certainly bear reviewing in this context of understanding the power that God says he will bring to bear his power to accomplish his will and in ways that would confound us to even consider doing, them, doing it the way that he proclaims that we should be doing it. In Judges chapter 7, we'll read verses 1 through 7. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. So the setting is he has got his army, and he is there. He has been chosen by God to free Israel from the captivity uh, from the Midianites, and even there the Amalekites are mentioned, that uh, they had been allowed seven years prior to that to take Israel into captivity because of all the wickedness of the sins that Israel was committing. And so Jeroboam, Gideon, knowing that this is a, a rather formidable army that he's going to have to fight, uh, he goes out and recruits, if you will, or drafts, uh, selects, picks, encourages, whatever, uh, an army to go fight the Midianites and the Amalekites. And he assumed this would be, require a large army, and his, in his eyes would be a large army, and thus he gets 32,000 soldiers that, uh, that are part of it. He doesn't tell you there are 32,000, but we'll see that as we read the other verses here. And once we understand a little more, even 32,000 doesn't seem all that great of an army by comparison to what he's going to do. But read in verse 2, And the Eternal said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into, the hands, in, into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hands have saved, her hand has saved me. So God is going to take a different course than just have a large army for Gideon to use to fight the, the, uh, the army. So now therefore proclaim it in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So he had an army of 32,000. And so he, he allowed those that were afraid to simply leave. They very likely didn't want to be there in the first place. But somehow they had been chosen, coerced, uh, whatever, ridiculed, perhaps, into coming to, the, to fight. But the Eternal said to Gideon, The people are still too many. 
Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and it explains here the test he, he, he performed, had them perform, in order to narrow, narrow, narrow down the group of soldiers he was going to use to 300. So out of 32,000, 300 soldiers remain. That, uh, because the 10,000 was still too many, and God was not about to, to let the Israelites give themselves a, uh, an undeserved pat on the back for any victory they might, uh, they might achieve. So this, now the, the great sum of 300 men have been chosen to fight the army of the east, and that was the, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and it said, and people of the east. And uh, it was all done so that God would be the one who could claim victory on, over this army. And uh, then what happened was Gideon and his army of 300 defeated their enemies. Now, I won't go through the, the story of how they, the 300 soldiers tricked the uh, army of the east to actually turn on itself. And in the chaos and confusion, a great many died. We'll see that in just a moment. And so that what was left fled. And they were quite amazed because, as we'll see, the magnitude of this victory is not revealed until we check over in, in chapter 8. And there we can read verses 8 through, 8 through 10 in chapter 8. All right, let me go. Chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. I beg your pardon. So we'll pick it up in verse 10. It says, Now Zeba and Zalmunna were at uh, Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000. So they still had 15,000 had fled. That was the remnant. All of whom, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, which had 120,000 men who drew the sword, had fallen. So... Originally, the army was 135,000. So I wonder when uh, Gideon was encamped on one side of the valley with his 32,000, and he was able to see 135,000 <laughs> camped across the valley, was like, uh, we're in a bit of trouble. You know, we, uh, we, so we need to think about what we're doing here. And God said, don't worry, we'll, we'll take care of it. Uh, we'll send back almost all of them, I'll leave you 300. Now, that being the case, we, we know what happened with the 300, that uh, we shouldn't wonder why Gideon is mentioned over in Hebrews 11 <laughs> about one of being one of the faithful. If he could have seen the army that he was on the opposite side and God was going to use 300 men to overcome them, which he did, because he did not only defeated the army, 120,000 fell. He then we took the 300 and chased the remaining 15,000. He pursued them, caught them, captured two of the kings, the Midianites, and the record shows he later killed them as well, but completely routed the remaining army. Now that in itself is pretty confounding. Because there were 15,000 of them. And so he took his army of 300 and routed the remaining army and accomplished what God had commissioned him to do, but obviously not the way that he envisioned his plan of getting a gathering an army. And God obviously, not only the first battle, but chasing down the remnant of 15,000, we don't have the details about that, but God obviously saw to it that Gideon had another great victory. So 300 men versus 135,000. Amazing? Well, one would say so. And yet, what has God given us to do? As I mentioned, we have maybe 10, 11, 12,000 of us that are part of the living church of God. And the job he has given us to do is to preach the gospel and a warning message to the world and to Israel 
In the world, we have now in excess of 8 billion people. Now, it doesn't say to, it says to all the nations whether every person will hear that or not, but to the nations comprising 8 billion people. How are we to do that? And for modern-day Israel, I, I just took some, some numbers. Uh, I asked Siri, a uh, personal friend of mine, <laughs> that uh, uh, what, what, what's the population of UK? What's the population of Canada, the United States, etc.? Modern-day Israel. And rounded the numbers off, around 535 million people in modern-day Israel. Not all of them are true Israelites. We don't know how many there are that are Israelites, but still, we're a very small group of people with very limited resources to do a fantastic job. And what this story tells us here with Gideon, that it's not a matter of numbers. It's a matter that God says he will back up those of his chosen servants who commit themselves to doing that job, doing their part of it. That God doesn't need large numbers in order to have his commission his, or his, his plan fulfilled. Now, the other story is over in the book of Acts. And we've read, again, like the one with Gideon, we've read this story many times. And it actually comprises a good part of the book of Acts. But I think going through this, uh, and get, looking at the account, and, and hopefully will give us uh, the ability to have more meaningful prayer about the work we've been given to do, and learn some lessons as we, we review this particular account. And we can turn to Acts chapter 19, and we'll read verses 20. Through 21, a couple of verses, and Paul is in Ephesus, and he's been there for some time preaching, and he says, the word, and so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, and when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in his spirit, in other words, he, his plan, his, his desire, his, uh, his hope of the near future, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem. So that was where he is now. He wants to go to Jerusalem. And after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he has, uh, knowing how he has to travel, whether it be on foot or uh, on a boat, on a ship, one way or the other, this is going to take some time to do that. So he's, he's planned a good number of months or a few years in order for him to accomplish this to whatever degree was in his mind. So as we go through this account, I'm going to summarize sections of it because it, uh, as I said, it's a, the story doesn't end uh, for quite some time in the, in, the, in the account here. So I'll be summarizing certain sections and, and move it along, so bear with me if you will. I'll, I'll read some of the verses and some I'll just uh, review verbally. But let's turn over back to chapter 16, and we'll just note something, because that was his plan. But chapter 16 lets us know beforehand that what Paul thought to do, what he planned to do, didn't, didn't always come about exactly as he planned. So back in Acts chapter 16, on his, one of his journeys, in verse 5, it says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. And when he had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and those two areas are their geographic areas are, that are the lower part of what we would call today, we call it Turkey or then called Asia Minor. And he said, and, and uh, they'd gone in the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And that was essentially in the northern part of Asia Minor. After they had come to Mysia, and they tried to, uh, to go into Bithynia, which as it turned out was part of the of Asia Minor, northern part of Asia Minor. But the Spirit did not permit them. 
So Paul got the message through God's spirit, let him know that, no, you should not be going there. And the apparent reason was that was being covered uh, by one of the other apostles, perhaps. And that was not part of his mission uh, to go where, where they had gone. So he was going to recognize that everything was still up to God, up to Christ, as to what he did and where he went. But at least he understood that his plan, tentative plan, was to go from, from the Ephesus to Jerusalem and then onward to, uh, to Rome. So let's turn now back to Acts chapter 21. Acts 21, verse 1. So it now came to pass that when he had departed from them, this is from Ephesus, and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. We sighted Cyprus, passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre. It's on the Mediterranean coast. And th there the ship was to unload her, her cargo. And finding the disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. But that's, that's where he had intended to go. He gets the message through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. But when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and still went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. So in spite of the advice through these Christians, through people in the church, through individuals that Paul knew well, very, very possibly, they were told not to go. And yet Paul went on from there to uh, landing entire. He goes on to Caesarea, also on the Mediterranean coast. And that was in spite of give, being given the warning. So pick it up in verse 10. So he's now in Caesarea. And we stayed there many days. A certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, very likely from Jerusalem. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, being Paul, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Why, why are you making this stressful for me? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, then said, the will of the Lord be done. So Paul was again getting a very stern warning from someone recognized as a prophet that what was waiting in Jerusalem was very hazardous. And he said, going to turn into the hands of the Gentiles, thinking that, that the Gentiles there would, could very well could kill him. But we don't know what, what all was going to happen. He didn't know for sure, but he was determined to go. And again, it's in spite of, remember the Spirit convinced him not to go into northern uh, part of Asia, and he didn't go. And here... He's being warned that what it, what's waiting in Jerusalem is very troublesome. Was he not listening to God's spirit? Was he ignoring God's Holy Spirit? I don't think that's the case. I think what we see there, what we can see, is that these other individuals that were giving the warning could not see the unseeable, whatever God had planned, because Paul determined to go there. So... God's plan, if you will, can be at times flexible, depending on how, how we act and react to the things. But God has a plan, and we can see that plan unfold in an entirely different way than I think Paul would have envisioned one way or the other. So then in Acts 21, again the same chapter, we find him in Jerusalem in verse 27. Uh, he's, been, he's done something there, but uh, going into the temple for his a specific reason, not germane to the conversation here, but he'd gone there for a certain reason. And now in the seven days after the, this purification process 
were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, people who had seen and heard him perhaps in Asia, preached the gospel, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him because they assumed he had very likely brought some Gentiles into the temple, which Paul had not done. And that was the accusation in verse 30 uh, that uh, we read. And the whole city, all the city was disturbed. And the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Uh, so word spread quickly. And all of the devout Jews were after Paul and about to kill him. And this, uh, uh, this commander immediately took soldiers and centurions, ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. And if you read the, the uh, Greek word there implies they were striking him with sticks, with staffs, whipping him with whips, beating him with their fist. And the commander came near and took him rescued him. And this, in the account, this is the first time, first uh, situation where he's rescued by the commander, by the, by the Roman uh, soldier. Then he took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains just so he couldn't get away. And he asked who he was, who he was and what he had done. And some of them among the multitude cried one thing and some another. They were still uh, chaotic, out of control. So when he could could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. So, if you will, he rescued him and then arrested him. So, this had Paul been rescued the first time, and we did the very last verse of the, or in verse, uh, uh, in the verse uh, uh, at the end of the chapter, verse 39 and, and 40, Paul asks to speak to the Jews, and he's allowed to do so, that doesn't work so well. Uh, so in chapter 22, and I won't, the first 20 verses talk about the chaos that ensues. And so Paul has to be rescued a second time. We'll pick it up in verse 21. Verse 21, and then he, Paul is talking and he says, uh, uh, then he said to me, depart for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So he claims that Christ is telling him as a, as a Jew to go to the Gentiles. And that was enough to strike a match to, to, the, uh, to the dynamite again. And they listened to him until that word. So he'd been listening all this time. And they raised their voices and said, Away with this fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, uh, we read that, it's, we have to... <laughs> Uh, if, if they literally were tearing off their clothes and throwing dust in the air, it's, uh, we don't quite see those things today, but uh, it would be a rather, a, a, rather a mess. And uh, so the commander in, in, in reacted, ordered him to be brought back into the barracks and said that he would, should be examined under scourging. In other words, if you're, if you're causing this much of a problem, there's something wrong. So we're going to beat, the, beat, uh, beat it out of you as to what you've done, so that he might know why they shouted so against him. You, you must have done something heinous. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man as a Roman, an uncondemned? Uh, one can just imagine hearing this, the silence that <laughs> took over. Uh, uh, you're a Roman, you're a citizen. Yes. Oh, well, that's a horse of a different color. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll stop here. So, and again, you know, God does intervene. And that, uh, if you will, another time that he's rescued, uh, not in this case, not from the Jews, but from the Romans themselves. So we read <clears throat> that in, uh, in verse, uh, in, over in chapter 23, we can read the account. In verse 10, he says, And when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled into pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him to the barracks, etc. So that's uh, the, the, uh, 
the matter there that Paul creates this havoc and he's rescued once again from that. And in verse 11, I skipped over this, and meant to read this, that we find here in the midst of all of this, what's going on, I think Paul now is convinced that whatever his intentions were, that God has a different plan. And it's just about it, going to go about a different way than whatever Paul might have imagined. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So that's all we're given. And so that may have been the entire message. And at least that got the message to Paul, got to go across to Paul that, well, I'm not going to die in Jerusalem. Whatever is about to happen, that something else yet remains to be done. Wouldn't know how that's going to, to work out, but nonetheless, it will work. So in chapter 23, in verse 12, so it was when that day some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor kill or drink until Paul had been killed. So another plan put forth that one way or the other, the Jews were going to have Paul's life. Now, we know the story that a, uh, his nephew intervened, Paul's nephew intervened, passed the information to the, to the centurion, and then things changed. In verses 22 through chapter, or verse 30, uh, if you will, this is the fourth time that Paul is rescued and just to prevent where he being attacked, prevented from being attacked, the commander takes great precaution and chooses to move Paul from Jerusalem, send him down to Caesarea to Felix, the governor in charge of that area. And perhaps uh, that was because he now knew Paul was a Roman and, and, in, and with knowing what had been going on in Jerusalem, that Paul's life was in danger, and this might continue, and so I'm going to put uh, the monkey on somebody else's back <laughs> uh, to turn this over to someone else because he's a Roman, and I don't want that responsibility. Perhaps that was part of it. So he sends him down there. Chapter 24, uh, I'll just mention this, that we find there are a lot of details about Paul and situation he gets there and he gets, gets down to, to Caesarea and with Felix, uh, the governor, there's conversations, I suppose, back and forth. And it tells us there that Felix was hoping Paul would give him some money and so he could set him free. It was a way of uh, personal gain. But he's there for a little over two years. And two years of waiting for a decision to be made and not delivering any money, if that's what Paul figured out as well, that uh, maybe there had been hints being dropped from, from Felix. Uh, you know, we could negotiate this uh, over the table, Paul, if, uh, if you happen to have a little spare change. Uh, who knows whether how much Paul knew about it. But regardless, God, Christ, had told Paul, I'm going, to say, I'm going to get you to Rome. Well, two years passed in Caesarea. Might Paul wonder, what's the holdup? What's the plan? <laughs> I thought I was going to Rome. And this is, I can't understand what's going on, but I know I'll get to Rome one way or the other. In chapter 25, we find that Felix, the governor in Caesarea, has been replaced by a man named Festus. Festus, given the account, and being a new man, the new ruler on the block, so to speak, uh, it says that to uh, perhaps gain favor with the Jews, uh, make, makes a, a good first impression, uh, thinks maybe we could take Paul up to Jerusalem and there have a trial, and makes that suggestion to Paul in the first, again, first 12 verses of the, of the chapter and when Paul is given that offer, by now Paul well understands he has, there's no wisdom and no safety 
at all in going back to Jerusalem. That very likely he would die there. So he does what he has the right to do as a Roman citizen. He appeals to Caesar and doesn't immediately get to go, but Festus says, okay, you've appealed to Caesar, then you'll go. You'll go to Rome. So when we finally move over, we're over to chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. It says, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the August, uh, Augustan regiment. So they aboard a ship to head for Rome. The story, chapter 27, uh, it's now later in the, in, the, in the year, and as we approach winter, and even it passes, it mentions it, uh, what we know to be atonement, the day of fasting, that it's not a good time to be sailing through the, through the Mediterranean Sea and reach a certain point, and Paul gives them advice, you know, fellas, we, we, should, we shouldn't do this. We should go a different way for a while and winter elsewhere. And don't, they don't take his advice. So they have a very, very hazardous journey on that ship, end up being uh, the ship uh, being wrecked, uh, and they end up being stranded in Malta for a while. And Paul had told them, probably to change, change course, they ignored him. And then the storm is so bad, but Paul says, oh, by the way, now you should have listened to me, but if you'll listen to me now, uh, you won't die. The ship, we'll lose the ship and everything. We've tossed everything off anyway. The ship will be lost, but no one will die. I've had an angel tell me this. And maybe if with all that was going on, they would thought, maybe, maybe we should listen to this guy. He, he might know what he's talking about. He maybe he has an inside source of information and whatever it might be. Of course, they agree to do that, and the ship wrecks, and they're on Malta, stranded. Later on, they're able to get another, get another ship and go on to Rome. So let's turn over to Acts 28. Acts 28, read verses 16 and 17. Now, when they came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. And Paul was permitted, or but, but Paul was permitted, to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So, being a Roman citizen, again, and we don't know about the other prisoners, why they were there, but being a Roman citizen, perhaps that gave him a certain privilege. But one way or the other, God granted him some grace and favor in the eyes of, of the powers that be there. And he was permitted to dwell by himself with just the one soldier guarding him. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So he tried, as his practice was, he went first to the Jews, and then he would go to the Gentiles, so he was there, and get, so he preaches to them and talks about Jesus Christ. Uh, some of them uh, believe him. He says some, some of them actually believed. Some didn't claim to do so. Some did find him, did not, did not find him all that credible. And it says in verse 24, some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and even some believed. And in verse 25, when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet, to our fathers. And he goes to quote some verses from Isaiah that says it's exactly the way God forecasted and foretold that you are refusing to listen to the word of God. So uh, he falls, certainly falls out of, out of favor with them. And so in verse 28, to the Gentiles I'll go and they will hear it. I'll take salvation to them. Verse 29, and when he said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, 
preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him to do that. So Paul was at Rome and he got to preach the gospel there. Now, if we add, this is now in, in excess of maybe not all that much excess, but in excess of four years from the time he had left Jerusalem in order to get to, to, to Rome. I can't imagine that Paul had intended that he would take, once he got to Jerusalem, he'd take four more years to get to Rome, one way or the other, whatever his normal travel plans and dreams might be. But let's note one thing here. I mean, let's go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Read the verses 15 and 16. And just rehearse what was the commission that Christ gave to Paul. Verse 15. This is when Paul was called. He says, but the Lord said to him, talking now, he's now talking to to the one who would go and uh, deliver the message and did not want to go to see Paul. But through, through this, uh, this prophet, God sends a message. It says, go and for he, referring to Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, to preach my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul was given a briefing by Christ as to the kind of years, the kind of things he would have to endure in fulfilling his mission of going to Gentiles, kings, and Israel. He would go to the Jews first. And that was the mission he was given to do that. So during that, that account that we just, we just read, that if you noted, Paul was able to do all three. There was still work to be done in taking the message to the Israelites. He, was, he took the gospel back to the Jews in Jerusalem. And he did the same when he got to Rome. And along the way, he talked to kings, where they were literal kings at in that prophecy, that comment there, or, or princes and leaders, governors. Uh, he did talk to King Agrippa while he was in Caesarea. He talked to the governor, Fe, uh, Felix and Festus. And so he gets to Rome. Of course, he's now preaching as well to the Gentiles. So this trip alone, the two-year trip, was, again, a further completion or a further part of completing the overall mission that God had given him, not, not necessarily what Paul foresaw when he was leaving Ephesus. He wanted to go to, to Jerusalem for whatever time and then depart and go on to Rome and go to the Jews, go to the Israelites first, then go to the Gentiles. But God saw to it there was more to do. There were certainly obstacles endured along the way. I mean, considering the, the boat trip, the ship, uh, and all the problems there, and the, the troubles, if you will, the dire circumstances, they were not easy. So when he gets to Rome, things greatly improved. So we find, find that account that uh, we, 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 bend, we begin this account then back in chapter 19. Chapter 19 is where we started. And... From 19 on, 20 through 28, nine chapters of the book of Acts are devoted to Paul's trip to Jerusalem and from there and then back to Rome. That's a lot of detail. A lot of information is given. A lot of examples are shown of Paul doing the work that God, that Christ had given him to do. Not in the way Paul envisioned Paul had plans, but he also would, whatever the twists and turns were, he kept doing the work wherever he was. Paul had his plan, and I think there's an important lesson 
to be gathered here in this account in the last nine chapters of Acts that shows us that God has a plan. Christ has a plan for how this work will be done. And he's going to do it in a way and get it accomplished that might surprise us, will surprise us. Paul, you know, nothing's written of what Paul intended to do, but we have the account of what, what transpired. And there was simply more to be done. I think it, it shows us and communicates to us that we don't know all the ins and outs and all the twists and turns that remain yet ahead of us in the years between now and the time that the work is finished. We plan as we should. We plan. Ideas are, are thought, are, and God can inspire ideas. And discussions are made and plans are made on what we will do, and we'll, we try things, and sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't work the way we think they should, so we stop doing that and we, we try something else. We take our gospel, we, we take the telecast, something that uh, Mr. Wakefield is intimately involved with, in selecting TV stations to, to contract with them and try to get the gospel out on the, with the telecast. And some of the stations work well, and some don't work so well, certainly for the money it, it costs to, uh, to, for the contract. And so we cancel that contract, and we go looking for other stations, someplace to use our money wisely. And there are programs that we have. You know, right now we do, we have uh, the whiteboards. We have Viewpoint. We have the Telecast. We have Tomorrow's World magazine. We have about 40, or I think 40-some 40, 40 booklets now to communicate the gospel and the plan of God. And there'll be more booklets, and there in this Tomorrow's, uh, Tomorrow's World magazine, which goes out, which is our, our magazine to, to preach the gospel, the LCN for the co-workers and for the members uh, is primarily intended for a, 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 different, a different kind of, uh, uh, let's see, scripture or scriptural message for, for us. And there are other ideas that will be brought forth, but Christ will show us how he wants the work to be accomplished. What we've seen is how God and Christ will intervene to take the work in the way they want it to be done. We've seen that, and I think we'll find similar events in the years ahead. There'll be some twists and turns that we can't foresee as we undertake the remainder of our job. But I want to point then move to something. Let's turn over to Peter, to 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. We don't know how much time we have left. Many of us sitting here did not plan to be here, as I've said before, and we all know that we didn't think we'd be here in 2023. And the examples that, uh, that we find going on in our world today, uh, we thought they were bad back in 1970. We thought they were bad in 1980. But really didn't understand how bad things were going to be. And maybe, just maybe, we still haven't seen exactly how far God will allow man to, to go down the wrong path before he intervenes. But in Second Peter chapter 3, here's part of the reason. Verse 8 says, But beloved, Peter writes, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we rightly apply this to us today. God's patient with us. Works with us patiently, long suffering, but it, we also apply it to the world. That God is long suffering with the world, and we also even look at how the God's plan of salvation will unfold with the white throne judgment. He is very long suffering. 
So God is going to give mankind every chance, every opportunity to come to heed the warning message that is going out and to repent. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 talks about the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And again, that especially applies to us as God's people. That God doesn't punish us in, uh, every time we make mistakes, every time we sin. He lets us have mercy, shows his mercy, and we have time to change, time to come to our spiritual senses. So God's very patient. But God will, at some point, all the, uh, all the twists and turns notwithstanding, and all the things that might unfold, God will, at some point, intervene. The work will end, the work will be done, will be finished. And he'll bring this work to a close. And he'll proceed then with the prophecies about the end of the age, the very uh, final prophecies about the end of the age. And that at that time, God will punish the world for their sins. Until then, he will give them chances to repent. And in the meantime, we have to keep doing what we're doing. And we have to keep doing the work. I'll refer you here, I'll just mention it in, in name, uh, to one of Dr. Meredith's articles in a Living Church News all the way back 21 years ago in 2002. And it was in the May-June issue. The title was, Prepare for Christ's Return. LCN of May-June issue in 2002. And there were two sections, the whole article, take the time to read it, obviously very important, but two, two sections are of note, and, and looking back again at it, it says, what should, be, what should you be doing? So he's writing to the church. What should we be doing? And what he says there still applies, which we should be doing the work following whatever, op whatever open door Christ provides, doing the work. And then the other section is the reality of Christ's coming government. And then reminding us that, yes, the work will be done. It will be done at a certain point. And Christ himself assured that that would be the case. Back in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, the gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The work will be done. We don't know how. We don't know all the avenues that God and Christ will open to us. But we stay close to God, stay close to Christ, and let him guide us, and we stay a part of that. We stay faithful to that. I think the same way that Gideon, when his army was narrowed down to 300 and he saw the other, the other side, he had to be, at that point, a man of faith. And that's what God expects for us to be, a man of faith. Let's go back to, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And how we pray about the work, how we do the work. John chapter 14, pick it up in verse 12. Christ is talking to his disciples. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. So he's talking about doing the work that Christ had been doing. Christ came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's the work we've been given to continue doing. And he said that his followers would even do greater works. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So how we pray about the work, how we put our earnest emotions into, God's, into our prayers about God's work, 
that he will show us what he wants us to do, and then we faithfully do it. And God says, Christ tells us that God will do that. He will honor our prayers. He'll honor our request to help us do our share of the work. So in closing, I'd like to read, this is uh, frankly part of the uh, inspiration, if you, I hope, for the sermon, uh, this article by uh, Mr. Ames in the latest Living Church News. He talks about, entitled it, The Greatest Mission on Earth. And it's on page six, and I'll, I'll finish in, in the sermon just reading uh, uh, a couple of sections here from page six. Most of you reading this article will be familiar with these important verses from Scripture. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Notice Jesus said, All authority has been given to me. The King James Version writes that all power has been given to Christ. And then in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, Habakkuk in a prophecy writes, as here in context, Habakkuk is talking about the Chaldeans coming against the nation of Judah. And God proclaims, in essence, I am going to work a work in your days that you won't even believe if I tell it to you. So that is what he's doing today. How important is that promise? Mr. Ames asked. It's important enough that the Apostle Paul repeated it in Antioch, that, that's the, uh, the Pisidian Antioch up in Asia Minor, to apply to a work being done in, his, in the first century A.D., after Jesus' death and resurrection. And Paul writes, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for a, a, work, a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were declared, to declare it to you. That's in Acts 13, verse 41. And Mr. Ames writes, The work is of utmost importance to us as Christians, and we each have our part in it. He closes this paragraph, he says, He tells us to work, but reassures us that he is with us, and he will accomplish that work.